and welcome to The View from 22. My name's Lucy Dunn and I'm joined by The Spectator's political editor Katie Balls and Spectator writer and Times columnist Ian McWhorter. It's been a turbulent few weeks in Scottish politics and it's all come to head today with Hamza Yusuf announcing his resignation. Ian, can you take us through what's happened over the past few weeks and how we've actually got to this point? Well, tensions have been growing within the uh, coalition between the Greens and the SNP for some time mainly over a succession of policy failures, some of which the, the Greens were implicated in, um, the deposit return scheme, um, uh, there was a gender recognition reform uh, bill, um, the Hate Crime Act. And there was a feeling growing, I think, that, the, uh, that this relationship between the Greens and the SNP could well have been coming to the end of its natural life because a lot of people in the SNP had been complaining but the Greens were the tail wagging the dog. I think it came to a head, though, perhaps surprisingly, not over independence and not over even the uh, abandonment of the uh, the, the recent uh, climate targets, but over this vexed issue of transgenderism and specifically the caste report. It seems to have been um, uh, the, the co-leader of the Greens, Patrick Harvey's, refusal to accept the validity of the uh, cast report and to continue uh, calling for uh, opposing the idea of a pause on puberty blockers. That seems to have been the issue that really uh, led to the, the final breakup. It is, it is very strange because it wasn't really independence was supposed to be what the two parties were in the common project of trying to achieve. So, and that's, that's what happened. The tensions got too great. Hamza Yusuf, decided he had to pull the plugs on it. Unfortunately, he did it in a rather unceremonious way. He just called them in early in the morning, told them they were to pack their bags and leave the Butte House Agreement. And now he says he's surprised that they were upset about it. Well, I, I can't imagine that they could not have realised that it was this would be taken, you know, very seriously by the Greens. And Katie, you've been watching the resignation speech given by Hamza Yusuf this morning. What did you make of it? What did you make of his emotional plea to his family and his discussion about he didn't quite understand what the Greens um, were, were going to act like, how they were going to react um, after he had sort of cut down the Butte House Agreement? Yeah, I think to Ian's point, you can see from that that effectively Hamza Yusuf is admitting that he made a catastrophic miscalculation in terms of tearing up the power sharing agreement with the Scottish Greens. Um, he did so... Um, last week after initially uh, suggesting he planned to stick with the Greens. Um, so we talk about the CAS review, but of course um, there was also the climate target, the fact they wanted to pressure there. You had the Greens going to their membership. At the time, Hamza Yusuf was saying to some of his party, no, let's stick with the Scottish Greens. He had this change of heart for some of the reasons Ian outlined. But I think in that press conference that we just heard, saying that he had not, he had underappreciated the level of hurt he would cause to the Scottish Greens by pulling out in the way that he had done. And that ultimately meant that there's been this sense, that last week when we were talking on our podcast about it, um, there's just been the sense of events spiralling out of his control. And everyone's kept saying, well, he must have he must have thought all this through. He must have thought all these steps through. Um, quite clearly what happened is he did not quite realise how the Scottish Greens could respond. He also said he spent the weekend, as we know, speaking to, you know, figures in the Green Party, figures in Albert, Alex Salmon's fellow Independence Party. And he said that he could have passed he could have won those two votes that we we're expecting this week. One a no confidence vote in his leadership, one a binding no confidence vote in his government, which would have meant the government fell. Um, but he was not willing to do the deals he needed to do. Now, that appears to be a reference at Ash Reagan, Alba and Alex Salmond. He'd been pretty out there this weekend, much more Alex Salmond notably than Ash Reagan, um, giving these interviews saying, oh, we'll work with him, we'll give him this one vote, we'll keep the S&P um, you know, propped up, but only if we get certain demands. And we didn't know the specifics, but they wanted various things. And that caused some uh, unrest within the SNP. And I think you could tell from that speech where Holmes Yusuf was quite emotional, you know, talking about his legacy, talking about the fact he was proud to be the first politician of Asian and Muslim heritage to win the role, talking about how he was happy to have some of the highest taxes in the UK, saying this is the most progressive, that you know he wanted to point to some things. But I think 
What I took away from it is the way he was talking is that he thinks the path to the SNP effectively staying in power is going to be through a deal with the Greens. And it seems as though he felt that he was no longer in a position to do that. I think the statement the Scottish Greens have put out since that press conference effectively saying, you know, they're always willing to work with opposition in a constructive way, saying that the SNP has the right to try and form a minority government, suggests that there could be a path there. And now it depends somewhere on getting a candidate who is going to work for the Scottish Greens. Um, Hamza Yusuf clearly not in the camp to want to team up with Alba. Yeah, and as you're saying, there's a real question about who's going to come next now. And now Hamza said today that he's not going to step down right away as First Minister. He's going to wait until someone else is selected. And there's a number of names that have been swirling around and been speculated about this weekend. That includes Kate Forbes, who ran before in last year's SNP leadership contest. We've heard talk now about John Swinney, who served under Nicola Sturgeon as Deputy First Minister. What are the different factors that will have to be looked at by the SNP when it comes to selecting their next First Minister? Yes, I think it's a lot still in flux because obviously we've just had um, Hims Yusuf's announcement. And the Bookie's odds are very much leaning towards John Swinney, who decided not to run after Nicola Sturgeon left. I think suggested he never wanted to be First Minister, but lots of people said they never wanted to be Prime Minister and then look at them now. And therefore, you know, I think there, there is space for that. I think he is seen as a very safe pair of hands and perhaps someone who would not have the title caretaker first minister, but could guide the party to a point whereby, uh, you know, navigating it so they avoid having uh, another no confidence, they avoid having this early Scottish Parliament election, but then potentially later down the line, around the time of the Scottish Parliament elections, the party's in a place to pick a, a leader more for the long term. Um, I think then you also have, of course, Kate Forbes, who was um, a useless rival last time around. Um, could she be tempted to run again? I think the tricky thing for Kate Forbes is right now, the party does not want an early Scottish Parliament election. And you look at all the previous comments of the Scottish Greens, they do not want to work with Kate Forbes. And I think in this leadership contest, I mean, it was a factor last time around in the sense there were questions about what happens with the Greens, but I think probably more acutely, you're gonna have a situation where people say, well, sure, if you're going for it, are you just gonna throw the party into an immediate Scottish Parliament election? Or is your plan to do a deal with uh, Alba, for example, which is clearly divisive to some parts of it. I think it's also an interesting one. You know, if you look at the bookies odds, um, and there's there's a mix here, always gives you a good indicator. But um, you know, there is also um, Stephen Flynn, who's the Westminster MP, and he is the Westminster leader. Now, he is 40 to one, um, according to William Hill. So not seen as a sure thing, but lots of people are talking about as a potential future leader. And could you have a system where actually you just trade out one MSP, you get him into position, then he's able to do so. Um, but, you know, the book is also talking about Neil Gray. And, you know, I think some even saying, you know, 25 to 1 Ash Reagan, which seems quite unlikely given she's not in the party. Um, I think the question is, is there an effort within the SNP to say, given all the problems they currently are having, let's rally around one candidate and get us to a more secure place um or do some candidates think actually no i'm not going to go along with that which is when these ten these things tend to break down a bit and ian what do you think is going to be hamza yusuf's legacy now that he's stepped down he's become the ser- second shortest serving first minister of scotland after henry mcleish what has he done in his time well uh, i mean hamza yusuf's legacy will be well i mean it's it's going to be more of the same, really. It's going to be very chaotic. He's, you know, uh, he had a very undistinguished period as first. So he's, he's a very nice man, I hasten to add. As, you know, everybody testifies to that. He's a lovely guy. But um, unfortunately, everything he touches tends to fall apart one way or another. Now, he's left the, the party in a very difficult situation because while he's announced his intention to ri- resign, he hasn't actually resigned yet. So he's going to be around for a bit longer and uh, t- until the SNP can, you know, uh, elect another leader. And that's going to be extremely difficult because the Greens uh, have said that they will not accept the front runner in that contest. Kate Forbes, because she's a social conservative, she doesn't like trans politics, she wouldn't revive the gender recognition reform bill, etc. Um, and I think that's going to be very awkward. The, the only other 
potential candidate, the Sturgeonite candidate, if you like, the pro-green candidate would be Jenny Gill Ruth, the education secretary, who interestingly happens to be married to the uh, to the former leader of the um, Scottish Labour Party, uh, Kezia Dugdale. But I think this, that's partly because of that connection. I think that's going to be very difficult for a lot of the SNP membership to take, to accept that the Greens are now t- dictating who is going to be leading the Scottish National Party, who's going to be in the fate of the government, and also deciding who's going to be the First Minister of Scotland. This is a party which has maybe 8% of the, the popular vote in Scotland. It's a very marginal force. Um, it's, it really only rose to prominence because it allied uh, itself loosely to this cause of independence and rode in the back of the, uh, of the SNP. And I think for many in the party, uh, they will find it intolerable that the leading candidate, uh, that put you many regard as the most able candidate, cannot be considered for the leadership because of the Greens' uh, disenchantment with it. So well, that gets us back to the situation we're in before, that, you know, if, um, if, if, if the SNP elects somebody who the Greens don't like, it would be back to deciding whether or not they would, they would be able to do a deal with Alex Salmon to get them through another no-confidence more vote. So the Hamza legacy is just, I'm afraid, going to be more of the same. And ultimately, we're left with a situation where it seems as though the Greens still have a lot of influence over the party, as you were saying. What is the outlook for the SNP over the next couple of years, when leading up to the 2026 Hollywood election? Are the Scottish Greens going to continue to have a big say, essentially, in the future of the Nationalist Party? Yeah, I think this is an interesting one because you look at that Scottish Green statement and they say they're used to working effectively from opposition. So that suggests that they're, you know, they're not trying to revive the Butte House Agreement, um, but they're also implying they are willing to get behind uh, SNP First Minister as long as it's the right candidate. And I think probably after the tumultuous events of last week where I think clearly Hamza Yusuf's decision to abruptly end the agreement took them by surprise, there was, in the words of Yusuf, a lot of anger, a lot of hurt. Um, I feel everyone has calmed down a bit and probably you know the greens are thinking too would we really want to go into an election right now how would our membership see that how would our voters see that if the result is to have for example a unionist first minister eventually perhaps Anna Sawa so I think we're probably at the point where they will be able to exert some influence and you could argue this has emboldened them um, because would imply, if they cannot find any other partner, how heavily reliant the SNP are on them, even without that. But I think perhaps some independence for both sides would actually be quite healthy, because just as the Greens did not want to be associated with uh, the climate targets, there's also questions in the CAS review, um, having a bit of space to oppose the SNP, while also you know keeping them where they are, might, might be what's most comfortable for both parties at this point. 